CataractCoach.com. Welcome back to our podcast series. Today, episode 18 with Eric Donenfeld. Now, I'm sure you all know the name Eric Donenfeld, a household name in ophthalmology. Eric's been on the forefront of everything anterior segment, cataract, cornea, refractive, MIGS, for the last 40 plus years. He's very well known as a key opinion leader in ophthalmology. You've seen him on the podium in many meetings. And one of the things that's most admirable about him is his joy of teaching and spreading knowledge to our peers. And he does that always with a great sense of humor. Truly a pleasure to have this podcast with him. I learned so much, and I think you really enjoy it too. Check it out. I want to welcome you guys to our Cataract Coach podcast. This time with a man who has taught me so much, I should probably be paying him royalties. Eric Donenfeld. Eric, I want to first, first start off by telling you, when that US, the Newsweek list of the top ophthalmologists came out, you know what my mom said to me? She says, how come, she says, how come you're not number one? Plus, I remember you got a B plus in eighth grade. Yeah, I was uh, pretty amazed by that list. I looked at all the amazing people on that list, and people asked me about that. And I say, there are a lot of amazing ophthalmologists in the country. I'm not sure how they determine the order. But having you and me being number one and number two, I said I'm in pretty good company with Uday. Oh, you're too, you're too kind. Well, the one thing that I really enjoyed the most about you is you are just a natural teacher. And the number of like surgical pearls I've learned from you over the years, your presence on the podium, you're probably my favorite speaker on the podium. Because you teach so much and you have me in stitches. I'm laughing the entire time. Well, you know, somebody, that's what I'm looking for. I love education, but more importantly, I like making it fun. I think when people are having fun, the pearls of wisdom, if there are any, tend to be remembered better. And people, I think, are more attentive. So I think learning should be enjoyable. And for me, that's at the heart of everything that I do. And you do the same thing, Ude. When you're talking... We're having fun together, right. and, and it's all right. about having fun, it's about education, and it's about basically making ophthalmology a better place. Yeah, there's an amazing camaraderie we have in ophthalmology. I think we're really blessed that not all medical specialties have that. You're absolutely right about that. Ophthalmology is a, a very unique place, and really that separates us from a lot of other specialties. I think that, you know, for me... It's all about relationships, and, sure. and in ophthalmology, we make friends for life, and when I go to a meeting, I'm going for the meeting, but I'm also going to see the friends that I've gained over the past several decades, and um, those relationships, and not only ophthalmologists, they're also with industry. Right. The relationships that we have with our colleagues and with our industry partners really are, I think, at the core of innovation. Um, when we're together, we think about things a little bit differently, and, and it's just one of the real enjoyable aspects of our profession. Yeah, you know, you have a great point there. I truly love the physician-industry relationship because we can help the industry give us the products we want in our future, and they can help us teach us, like, the, the backstory of, like, how the FACO machine works, the fluidics, the, like, engineering behind it. It's really a beautiful symbiotic relationship. And honestly, these days, there's, a, there's an absence of the younger ophthalmologists involved with that. How do we get the 30 and 40 year olds who watch Cataract Coach every day, how do I get them more involved with industry? Well, being involved with industry, I, I think has really been a two-edged sword and that sometimes it can be misrepresented, but as long as you always place the patient first. And whatever you do when you work with industry, the patient always is the person that you're thinking about. Sure. You'll always sure. go in the right direction. But industry is looking for young superstars. You're looking for people who are going to make a difference, people who have unique ideas. What industry needs is they need people to recognize unmet needs. And that's what mm -hmm. we as ophthalmologists yeah. do. Industry cannot recognize an unmet need. They're there to help us solve the problem of, of unmet needs. But when you're looking at a problem, try to think of novel ways in which this problem can be solved. And that's where industry comes into play because when I take these novel ideas, and you do the same thing all the time, Ude, when you find a novel idea and you take it to industry, now we can work together to kind of solve problems. So if I had a 30 or 40-year-old I wanted to give them some advice, it would be, 
pay your dues, get really good at what you do. And when you do that, people are going to notice you and they're going to pay attention. Yeah, but again, great, great point there. Think differently. How can you help the patient even better? And then you bring the ideas and collaborate with industry to make it happen. Well, you know something, I got that from my college background today. I know your son's graduating oh. from Dartmouth this weekend. And what Dartmouth is really known for is, is for its liberal arts education. And I, t I take that message really into ophthalmology as well. And whatever you learn in the course of your career, you'll find some way to apply it to other events. So I really started as a pure corneal specialist. Wow. And what I've wow. been able to do is to take my background in cornea and apply it to cataract and refractive surgery. And it's taking those ideas from other areas and bringing them into other specialties that's really been, for me, the core of innovation. There's no information that I've gained in my career that I don't use at some time or other to apply to other aspects of our profession. And that's the beauty of ophthalmology. We have so many exciting events that are taking place and we just kind of just put them together and find ways to make them interact. So that's a great point too. Tell me about your path to ophthalmology. Like a lot of people don't know that you're actually born in the Philippines. We have a lot of Filipino listeners and viewers on Cataract Coach. So I, the name doesn't sound Filipino, but he's Filipino. And then you, you obviously did training at Dartmouth for med, undergrad and med school. But then how did you find yourself in getting an ophthalmology? Well, you know, so my, my dad was in the Navy. I was born uh, at a naval base at Subic Bay in the Philippines. Um, I came to live on Long Island. and I lived next to a farm when I was about seven or eight years old. And it's kind of a sappy story today, but I'll tell it, it. Any, tell it anyway. And that I lived next to the farm and the farmer slaughtered a pig. And when he slaughtered the pig, he literally put the pig eyes in my hand and I went home. Now, today, that would be child abuse. They'd probably arrest him for doing that. But, it, but in those days, I took it home. And to my mom's credit, she looked at it and she goes, wait till your dad gets home. My dad came home. And my dad was an anesthesiologist. And the two of us dissected those eyes. And I knew all the parts of the eye. And I had them in formaldehyde. And I actually kept them next to my bedside. And I, when I was seven years old, I knew that I was going to be an ophthalmologist. Now, I wow. told my son this inspirational story when he was in college, maybe about going to medicine, and he looked at me and his response was, so uh, I guess you didn't have a lot of friends growing up, Dad, did you? But that's the, that's the moment that I realized that I, that's what I want to do. And I kind of went to college, I went to medical school wow. knowing that that's what I wanted to do. So I was very fortunate in that respect. You know, it's, um, there's a, um, a very famous quote by Arist I'm sorry, by Sir Isaac Newton, uh, that says that if he has seen father, he has stood on the shoulders of giants. And my response to that is that for those of us like me and you who have accomplished something, it's not only standing in the shoulders of giants, it's being held in the arms by our giants. And for me, those giants were my mother and father, and they gave me the, the inspiration to really be where I am today. Now I'm going to look at your bed. Do you have the jar still or that's gone? Yeah, that, that's gone. Uh, I, could, I can probably look for it. It's probably up in the attic somewhere. But no, you have a great point there. Yeah, we're not raised in a vacuum. We're, we owe a lot. We, we, didn't, we didn't accomplish any of this on our own. It's been all the people around us, our professors, our mentors. We're just taking it to the next level. So yeah, we are standing on the shoulders of giants for sure. Yeah, and, and we all have our individual giants. We all have people who have you know, kind of brought us where we are today. And one of the aspects, I think, of being a innovator and a leader like you are in our profession is that we didn't get here, as you said, in a vacuum. We got here thanks to the hard work of a lot of people who really made a difference in our lives. And I always make a point of really recognizing the people who got us where we are today. When people say, you know, Eric, how'd you accomplish this? I can list 20 people in my background who really sure. got me where I am today. And, uh, and every day that I practice, I'm really grateful for those people who really gave me the helping hand to bring me to where I am today in my profession. For sure, absolutely. You know, you gave a, an incredible ASCRS Bing course lecture about the road to innovation. Give us a few highlights from that. I, it was so inspirational for me, I loved it. I'm so honored that you actually saw it. I appreciate that very much. Uh, the Bing Course Lecture is the highest honor that you can get at ASCRS. It's a lecture named after Cornelius uh, Binghorst. 
And it's a letter about, it's a, it's a lecture about your career in ophthalmology. And, and mine, as you said, was, um, it was about the road to innovation, what a long, strange trip it's been. And um, it, it started with really thinking about the, the long, strange trip. And for those of you who are millennials, you may not know what that means, but that was a very famous quote by the Grateful Dead. Sometimes the light's all shining on me. Sometimes I can barely see. Uh, basically what a long, strange trip it's been. And a lot of people ask me, and I'm sure they ask you, Day, the same thing. How did you get where you are today? And it really started when I was in my second year after finishing my fellowship in Corny at Will's Eye Hospital. And I finished the fellowship, and I was at Manhattan Eye Near, where my chairman, who was one of my giants, Jack Doddick, said to me, Eric, we have a new technology, and that technology... I'd like you to be one of the investigators of this technology at Manhattan Ioneer. And these are things he said to me. He said, Eric, I want you to come to Manhattan Ioneer one day a week. We can't pay you for this. I want you to be you know, one of the investigators for this major study. And it probably won't work, but it'll be a good experience for you. And I grabbed the opportunity because, you know, something, I was going to get the ground floor and do something new and exciting. And it actually took six years. So every week for one day. I donated my time. I went to Manhattan Ioneer and I investigated this new technology. The technology was the eczema laser. And wow. that's how I became an initial investigator of PRK and later LASIK. And, you know, when people ask, how did you become an overnight success in your, in your profession? It's really by paying your dues, yeah. donating your time, researching and getting where you are today. And I don't think there are any real shortcuts to get where uh -huh. you are today. You got where you are today by paying your dues. You know, every time you go to the operating room, you're, you're thinking of something new. You didn't start out as a master surgeon that you are today. You started out as a very humble surgeon, like we all start out, but okay. you had the drive to really get where you are today. And that drive is basically hard work, um, just dedicating yourself and there just aren't any shortcuts. If you accomplish something in your career, you did it because you earned it. And you know, to your credit today, you really have earned it over the last 25, 30 years. You've been an amazing inspiration to so many people. Your, your videos are legendary. Oh, you're too kind, thank you. But you had a great point there. The entire building is built one inch at a time, one centimeter at a time. And so people say, oh, wow, how do you get all these caterpillar videos? So it's like, well, I made a new one every day for almost 2,000 days in a row. I've never missed a day. They're like, wow, either you're passionate or you're crazy. And I'm like, uh, both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not going to argue with you on that. But I think <laughs> almost all genius has a little bit of craziness involved with it as well. And, uh, you know, I, I've certainly been accused of the same. You know, I'm sometimes in the operating room and, you know, I'm the elder statesman in my practice now, and I'm sitting there um, at the end of the day working when everyone else has gone home, and I'm doing the complex cataracts and corneal yeah. transplants and Yamanis and glute IOLs and, and things like that. And all my younger partners are kind of looking at me and going, what drives this person? And, and for me, it's a passion for what I do. Yeah, I don't really, sure. I don't really feel that I work especially hard. I just feel like I'm enjoying every moment that I'm there. I'm sure you are just like me. You wake up every morning and what you look forward to is you look forward to going to the operating room. You look forward to going to the office. Absolutely. You know, I've been on, I've been in the past on vacation with my family and I'd say, oh, today's OR day. I kind of wish I was doing surgery. And they're like, what? You're here in this beautiful country, this beautiful scenery. All you can think about is working. I was like, well, it's not really work. It's just the OR is fun. And I do exactly the same thing that you just said. And then my wife, you know what she does? She just bops me. She just, <laughs> she just gives, me a, gives me a smack. And what, what I think you've just emphasized is really important for people. And that is there has to be a work-life balance. You have to be extraordinarily yeah. dedicated to your profession. But if you don't have the happiness of having a great family life, nothing works. So... I, at the Binkhorst Lecture, I, I basically stated at the end that um, there's not been a day in my career that I wake up in the morning not look, looking forward to going to work. And even more importantly, there's not one evening 
that I don't look forward to coming home to my wife and family. And if you don't have one, if you don't have both of them, you don't have anything. You have to have both. And, and that, that's probably the best advice I could give to some of you really dedicated people out there is make certain that while your career is extraordinarily important, your family is more important. And, and you have to always put that on the back burner. And sometimes my wife, who's kind of my rock, will look at me and say, Eric, time to stop working. Now it's time to do something with your family. And she always keeps me in line to make sure that I'm doing the right things. Yeah, you know, I've made that mistake in the past too. Maybe 15, 18 years ago, my kids were very young. And I was very proud that that year I achieved like diamond status for a hotel and i looked at the paper and said congratulations last year you spent 63 nights in our hotels and then i just felt like such a failure and then i yeah I, I took yeah i you learned i took many years then of like nope no meetings i'm only gonna hang out with my kids and now that i'm an empty nester i'm really glad i did that because ophthalmology is still here yeah your family knows that I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, that same son of mine who told me that I didn't have a lot of friends growing up. Um, when he was eight years old, um, I was the coach of the baseball team. And I was giving a lecture like you're giving. And I gave this lecture in Ohio. And they invited me to stay and play golf. And I said, no, I'm sorry. I can't play golf. I've got to go home. Not for a game. I've got to go home to coach my Little League team. So... I don't play golf at this real world famous golf course. I go home. I get on the flight. I arrive at the I arrive at the at the baseball field. I'm wearing my jacket and tie, and there is my son and one of the child. The teachers at school said there was a required uh, event that the kids had to stay for, and there's just my son. And my son looks at me, and goes, "Dad, I'm really sorry. I know you wanted to play golf, and you missed an opportunity." And I looked at him. I said, "Robert, don't be silly." I go, this is the best thing that could possibly happen. Now I get to spend more time with you. I never yeah. thought about it. I never even thought about it. Yeah. When my son graduated from high school, he was valedictorian. That's the story he told in his valedictorian address. I was oh. sitting in the audience and I didn't even think of it. And, and his point was, it's not the big things you remember. It's the little things you remember. Yeah. And just being there is so extraordinarily important that 10 years later... That was one of the events from his childhood that, that I had completely forgotten about, but it was important to him. So again, love ophthalmology, dedicate yourself, but also make certain you take care of your family and make sure that you realize how important they are to you. Yeah, that's a, that, that, that balance of work life, it can be pretty elusive, but over time it does get better. You finally do figure it out. I got news for you, Uday. Oh. You think you're gonna, it gets better. Eventually grandchildren take over and that's and I had like 10 years when I was a, when I was a free agent I could do all the things I wanted to yeah. now on weekends it's my daughter or my son calling me and go hey dad can you come up and spend some time with the grandchildren can you take them to play golf with you you know so so it, it does it comes back you you're in a little quiet period right now but don't think it's over 10 years from now you're going to be in that same situation that I'm in right now enjoy the lull before I become a grandpa huh Exactly. Yeah, no, those are all great points. I think, you know, our cataract coach, most of our viewers are very young. They skew ages, kind of 30 to 50 is our big demographic here, especially the, 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 in the in people in the 30s from residence fellows and let's say first 10 years of practice are a big part of our, our, our group here. And yeah, they do struggle with the work-life balance and how to fit all this in, but I think you can. Now, a, qu a question related to that is, what about different work environments? So a lot of the young people are saying, well, do I do a private practice? Do I do this big group? Do I have an academic one? There's a private equity thing. How do you navigate that space? We, we have zero business training in med school. You know, so I mean, that's a great question today. I get asked that a lot. And I've had a little experience with everything. I was a resident instructor and a program director in academics. I was in private practice. And about five years ago, um, I partnered with private equity. And what I've learned in this entire process is that it's all about the relationships and the people that you're working with. And you can have an amazing career in private equity, in academics, in private practice, but it all depends upon the people that you work with. And you have to trust the people you work with. So while it's really important, get a good contract, make certain that a lawyer looks at everything. But to me, 
you know, having a, a, a handshake, um, knowing the people you're working with and knowing the relationship is key. So there's no magic place to go. Um, there, are, there are bad people in, in insurance companies and there are bad people in private equity and private practice. But find the people that you want to work with. Make sure in the work environment meets your needs. Make sure that whoever you're working with understands that patient care comes number one. And, yeah. and, and you'll find your way. But one thing, one trend that I think is really important for the young listeners here today is to understand that uh, the, the, the environment is changing and the small private practice really can't exist going forward in most environments. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule, but certainly in the United States, you have to have a large enough volume to really be at the table when insurance companies come talking to you. Um, so I chose private equity because I didn't want to be at the uh, whims of a dean in a medical school, and I didn't want to have to deal with an insurance company. But um, there again, there's no right answer. But I think you need to find a large practice. the The day of the small private practice still exists today, but it's getting more and more difficult to do that. It, there's just too many headwinds against us. Uh, so medicine has changed. If you look at internal medicine and surgery, it's almost all gone into hospitals. So I'm very mm-hmm. happy. I'm in a great private uh, equity group right now. We have amazing people. Um, they, I'm on the board of the company, so they let me kind of determine the medical care that's provided. And um, we make decisions based on patient care, number one. But on the other hand, decisions made are also made with a uh, decision based on facts rather than just kind of a feel. In the old days, you and I would say, you know, I want, I want to buy a piece of equipment, and they would ask you why. Essentially, I feel like it. Now we actually do it. We actually do an economic model of oh, what yeah. we're buying. We understand what we're buying and why we're buying it. So you, you, you have to, uh, you have to back up the decisions you make. It just, it's just not done uh, as simply as it was in the past. But I think it's a better, it's a better model of making good decisions. How many? technologies do you have in your garage that basically failed that you, you bought and you used for six months and you end up not using it after that you, you have to make yep. you have to make better decisions going forward so we have all these like two hundred thousand dollar paperweights uh, yes. that, that we don't use anymore but that's kind of the fun of being an ophthalmologist is the toys we get to use we do get amazing toys but yeah i, I think you have a great point there that you're you've got to find the right fit for you and it's not, and, and, and also your first job may be like your first girlfriend or boyfriend. They may be great and all, but not the one you're with forever, not the ultimate lifelong partner. So it's okay to switch gears and change to a different position and find ultimately where you have the best fit. Yeah, you know, you're, you're absolutely right, Uday. You, you, you don't always know what's going to be right for you, but um, keep your options open. Uh, find out what makes you happy and, and, and make your practice what you want it to be. The last thing you want to do is to be in a practice where you don't look forward to going to work. So uh, do the specialty that you want to do, whether it be retina, glaucoma, general ophthalmology, refractive surgery, cataract surgery, but find out what makes you happy and then make that the important part of your practice going forward. Um, when, when you have that, you really, you really have everything. And there's just really nothing more rewarding today than being an ophthalmologist. And, and I tell you something, if I could do one thing in my career right now, I would start over again. I can't, wow. be- I can't believe the opportunities that young ophthalmologists have today. The technologies that are coming forward today are absolutely mind boggling. You know, I go back to where I started today and, you know, people always say that, you know, I've lived through the golden age of ophthalmology. That's not true. The golden age of ophthalmology is tomorrow. <laughs> And, yeah. uh, and the technologies are going to be incredible. So uh, I- I enjoy the ride and uh, it- it'll, it'll, it'll be incredible. But there's nothing more important than patient's vision. There's just nothing more important. You know, your health is important, but your vision trumps everything. And we are in a profession where we do something we love to do. We're very good at it. It makes a difference in patients' lives. Um, yeah. you-, you really can't ask for more than that, can you? No, I mean, it's right. We change the way they see the world every waking moment for the rest of their lives. It's like it's profound what we do. I'm I'm thankful every day that I'm an ophthalmologist. Yeah, and you know something? It's 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 funny. When I first started practicing, some people were still doing aphasic glasses. You know, you you have your cataract surgery, you put on plus fourteen glasses, uh, and now 
the discussion that you and I have with our patients who are having cataract surgery about the technologies that are available today, um, it's the fun part of what we do is finding the right niche for that patient that will give them happiness for the rest of their lives and, yeah. and, and determining what's, what's in their best interest. And then we have all these new technologies that are coming that we're looking forward to as well. What do you think some of these technologies are? I think accommodating lenses, hopefully, now that I'm presbyopic, I'm really interested in accommodating lenses. What else do you think is coming down the pike? Well, you know, I think that surgery has to be more adjustable. We have the light adjustable lens right now, but, but our technologies have to be more adjustable. It has to be more easily adjustable. It has to be adjustable for a lifetime. Um, we can't split light going forward. As you mentioned, accommodating lenses are exciting in that. This is a technology that will allow us to have clarity and crispness. Right now, we sacrifice quality and quantity. If you want quantity vision, you give up quality. There should be no sacrifices going forward. And that's what the promise of accommodating lenses are. So, that, so that's extraordinarily uh, exciting. Refractive surgery um, is one of my main interests right now. And, and I think refractive surgery will continue to grow. And our goal with refractive surgery used to be to make the patient 2040 so they could drive without glasses. Then it became 2020. Now the routine goal for refractive surgery is basically the patient should see better with their naked eye than they ever did with their best glasses before surgery. And that's what the promise of refractive surgery is. We can actually give patients better vision than they had with their glasses. And that's, that's amazing. And then if you really want to get esoteric and think about um, some of the engineering marvels we'll have in the future is that we're going to have lenses that are going to be like smartphones and they'll be in your eye and they'll be able to process your um, blood sugar and uh, they'll be able to tell you about your general health. They'll be able to look at things like infrared images. They'll store information. They'll store data. Um, your intraocular lenses are going to be uh, the smartphones of the future and, and so many companies, Microsoft, Google, they're all working on these technologies today and, and they will be coming. And finally, I do believe that in the future, we're going to have batteries in our lenses and our eyes and they're going to be, wow. they're going to be able to process information and we'll charge them overnight. You know, um, you'll wear a mask, a conductive charging mask? A charging station next to your bed will charge them, and they're going to allow you to have true accommodation and, 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 and truly process information as well. So when you get an intraocular lens, when you're 40 or 50 years old, you might be able to change it 10 or 20 years later and upgrade it. So you know, the, wow. lens, the lens you have in one, when, when, you, when you have your cataract surgery isn't going to be the same lens that you have 10 or 20 years later. So a lot of exciting things today. What are some of the things that you see going forward? What do you What do you like in the future? I think accommodating lenses. Now that I'm presbyopic, I really need an accommodating eye well. I hear you. I'm wearing glasses right now, which I never thought I'd do. You and I have been working with a great company, a LensGen. Yeah. Uh, we've done a lot of work with them. I think that's the most exciting accommodating lens right now. So I'm 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 hoping that that lens will make it to the uh, uh, FDA trials in the very near future. Yeah, you know, you're right. Laser vision correction, not just LASIK, PRK, smile, sure. fake, fake IOLs for that matter as well. Uh, they're all amazing technologies, and I think they're underutilized today. And I believe that there is a general misconception about the risks of the surgery relative to the benefits. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, um, some of the dark sides, you know, that, that kind of look at these procedures and, they, and yeah. they look at the negative side. I don't think we've really done a great job of marketing the true values of these procedures. You, you know, for me, it's more than just about vision. Refractive surgery is about quality of life. And yeah. it, makes, it makes our world safer. It makes patients' quality of life better. It's a cure for depression. 
Um, it, it gives you insights that you wouldn't have otherwise. So I, I've been very fortunate to be involved with refractive surgery from the very beginning. Um, I'll go off on a tangent now, and I'll tell you one sure. of the more um, memorable experiences of my career, and, and that I'd like to the listeners to maybe take to heart, was that about 15 years ago, the FDA actually had a panel discussion to determine whether or not LASIK should be banned. And a group of patients who were unhappy petitioned the FDA to have a conversation in which they got to stand up and present their concerns about laser vision correction and, and the problems that they had had. And then there were two or three of us who were representing the American Academy. I was representing ASCRS. And we stood and we gave the reasons to the FDA panel on why LASIK should be preserved. And, and uh, um, Kerry Solomon was there. I was there. Uh, Steve Schallhorn was there. And it was a very interesting conversation that when I listened to the patients who were complaining about their laser vision correction procedure, it wasn't the fact that they were unhappy with their vision that brought them there that day. It was the fact that they felt that their doctors had abandoned them. Uh, and that take-home message has resonated with me since that time. And a lot of ophthalmologists don't really invite patients with complications into their practice. They have enough hard time taking care of their own patients. I've always felt that we need to acknowledge our complications, but more importantly, probably, we need to embrace the complications of others and let patients feel that they've never been abandoned. And yeah. that was a take-home message that I got from the FDA panel, and it's really changed the way I practice. And now I really kind of look forward to seeing patients who have problems because it gives me an opportunity to solve the problems. And I don't think there's anything more rewarding than taking a patient who is unhappy and making them happy. And you must see the most complex cases in California yeah. coming to see you. And is, isn't there a certain rush when you have a patient who's having these problems and you, and you look at the patient and you say, I know what to do here and I can solve the problem and you embrace that patient. Those patients become lifelong friends. They, they, they come in, they hug you when you come in. And, and to me, there's no greater feeling in my life than solving a patient's problem. I think you're absolutely right. I had a patient recently, complicated case, aphakic, sutured in with Gore-Tex, an IOL to the sclera. And the patient, we aimed for an amotropic outcome of Plano and the patient ended up myopic. And there was a, there was a sticky note on the door of the of patient exam and the, my, my staff were, this patient is very upset. And so I walked in the room and I said to the patient, if I were you, I would be upset. And she says, what? And I was like, yes. And then instead of sitting across from her, I sat next to her shoulder to shoulder showed her her printout from the auto refractory. And I said, here's why I'd be upset. Because you and I together, we wanted to give you the best distance vision. And the way you ended up healing, you ended up myopic. And so here's what we're going to do to solve. We're going to let you heal up for a couple of months. And at the three-month mark, we're going to do some LASIK and take you from minus 150 to spot on amotropia or plano for that 20-20 distance vision. Hang in there. Even though you weren't the best healer, we'll get you there. You know, something that is extraordinary valuable information, and I do exactly the same thing you do. As a matter of fact, my staff is alerted that when a patient is unhappy, they tell the staff. When a patient is unhappy, my staff knows that the patient should have a topography, a refraction, and an OCT, so that I know what the problem is when I walk into the room. And what I don't allow to have happen is exactly what you do. I never let the patient vent it to me. I embrace them before I walk in and I tell them that they should be unhappy and I know what their problem is and I know how to solve it. It's so much better doing it that way than walking into a room and being blindsided and the patient's unhappy mm -hmm. and yep. you say, I don't know, I don't know, let's order some tests and find out what's wrong. So I go in knowing it's wrong and then I always tell the patient that even when the patient's angry with me, I say to them, we are on the same team. We both have the same goals. I am here to make certain that I can that I will resolve your problem and I will work with you to solve your problem and if I can't solve your problem I'll find someone who does. And yes. and 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 that makes the patients happy and you embrace them and I do exactly what you do. I sit next to them I say we're on the same team and 
that has really made my practice so much more enjoyable because once patients become angry and they vent at their doctors, that doctor-patient relationship is never the same. Oh. So never allow a patient to vent. Cut them off at the pass. Make certain that they know that you are teammates and working together, the problem will be resolved. But you, what you just said was a pearl. That was, that was, that was oh. your... Your your pearl for the day, Uday. I I couldn't agree more. And that patient of mine that I referenced has sent me maybe a dozen or fifteen of her friends now. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Those patients are ambassadors. You know, there's a misconception among young ophthalmologists that we need to make our patients happy. That is such a minimalist attitude. Uh-huh. Patients who are not happy don't come back and see you. Making a patient happy is the bare minimum that you can do to have a practice. What you really want to do is exceed their expectations. So taking a patient and giving them more than they anticipated is really the goal you should have every day when a patient walks into your office. You say to yourself, what can I do for this patient that's going to give them an amazing response that they're going to be, they're going to say, I'm really happy I got to see Uday today because he changed my life. Those are the people who tell everyone they know. They become your ambassadors. Yeah, you're right. You said it earlier in the conversation. You always you said, put patients first. In fact, in our clinic, my one rule is I lo- what I learned in kindergarten when I was five years old, which is the golden rule. I give the treatment to patients that I'd want for myself. Right. Always putting them first. Right. You know, I, I've told a lot of family stories and, and, and my, my life and my career revolve around my family. But I'll tell you one more story today if you have That's time for that. I love it. And that is my grandfather was that larger than life hero in my life. He was just an amazing person. And he owned the largest coal company in all of New York City, which is a big deal. I mean, a, you know, a, a big deal. And I asked him how he became successful. And what he said to me was, I would go into the super in apartment and I would tell them that Don and Phil coal burned longer than any other coal. And if it didn't burn longer, I would give them their money back. And I would sell them five tons of coal. And sure enough, that coal burned longer than any coal they'd ever had before. And I said, well, what was the key to your success? How did it burn longer? He said, I gave him six tons of coal. And 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 wow. that's that's how that's how he built the largest coal company in New York. Now, the flip side to that story is that when my grandfather passed away, again, larger than life, an amazing person, the company was bankrupt. And you know why it was bankrupt? It was bankrupt because coal went out of favor and oil became the dominant energy source for the apartment building. And he never made the change from coal to oil. And the take home message is that what you learn in your residency is not enough for your whole career. You've got to always adopt and, and accept new changes. And that's what I've been really excited about in ophthalmology is that I continue to look at new things, new techniques, new surgeries. And you can't always do what you trained in your residency. You have to adapt and learn new things. Otherwise, you're selling coal. Yeah. you. The way you operate today better not be the same way you operate 10 years from now. 100%. There's nothing that I do today that looks anything like what I was trained on. Nothing. Um, It it is just night and day what we do today. Um, It's it's incredible the advances that have have been made in cataract surgery. Um, Absolutely amazing. That's one of the challenges, though, right? Is keeping up with everything and then learning all the new technologies, the new techniques... I mean, just, I just think back like 10 years ago, 20 years ago when I was a resident, there was no OCT, no anti-VEGF, there was no lamellar corneal transplantation. These things did not exist. Right. And now it's, and now it's all, all different. And there's new things coming. Yeah. Um, yeah. New IOLs. You know, you talked about corneal transplants. We're going to be doing cell therapy this summer. There's going to be you know, all kinds of new things coming. So extraordinarily exciting new technologies that are coming down the pike and... Uh, and the geometric progression of new ideas is expanding. And that's why I say ophthalmology is the most exciting profession you could possibly have. Yeah, no doubt about it. So for young people who are just, let's say, in residency or just finishing, you want to probably sub subspecialize to have that really deep knowledge as opposed to being just very general and having a narrow band of knowledge? 
would you think? You have to do what makes you happy. You know, yeah, you, yeah, you have to find your niche. And for me, my niche was really anterior segment surgery. But, you know, Uday, you've become, if not the, one of the most preeminent cataract surgeons in the entire world. I'm not that person. I am really good at cataract surgery. I'm really good at corneal surgery. I'm good at refractive surgery. I never found one thing that made me happy. And, you know, I started out as a corneal specialist but I've adapted, I've adopted over time, and I, and I, and I keep finding new things that are, that are exciting to me. I'm even now doing glaucoma surgery. I, you know, I, I think MIGS has really revolutionized. Oh, yeah. I got very involved in MIGS right from the beginning. And um, um, you need to find what is exciting for you. Now, for some people, it's being a general ophthalmologist, like being a GP. For some people, it's being a super specialized guy like you, who's you know, state-of-the-art cataract surgery. For me, it's all about taking ideas from one specialty and applying it to another specialty. And that's really what I find exciting. Yeah. I mean, it, I, while I love cataract surgery, I soon realized many years ago that cataract surgery is our number one most powerful, most commonly performed refractive surgery. And so I'm very cognizant of my own clinic that I offer the full spectrum from LASIK, PRK, any kind of corneal, corneal treatments, phacic lenses, Refractive lens exchange for, let's say, the hyperopes who are, you know, 50 years old, cataract surgery, even complicated things then. Uh, mix procedures as well at the same time. And then in the future, if the patients have issues, sutured in lenses, anterior second reconstruction, pupiloplast, you know, the works. So we offer the spectrum. The list, the list goes on and on. And uh, I, I guess our practices are more alike than I knew they were. They, it was, you know, my litany is almost the same as yours. I have the same interests as you. And, you know, it's, it's cataract surgery is the most common um, refractive surgery. It's the most, also the most common glaucoma surgery as well. And that, right. and that it, it, it treats glaucoma. So cataract surgery is, is, is really an amazing procedure today. And, um, and again, only getting better. As I say, it's the world's most it's the world's most fun video game. This many tens of thousands of cases later, I still love it. I'm still not bored. You know something? You're absolutely right in that I, in my, my career has been defined by probably more refractive yeah. surgery than corneal refractive surgery than by cataract surgery. But on a busy day when I'm doing a lot of LASIK, I feel like it's the same case over and over again. When I do cataract surgery. Every case has something new. There's always yeah. a nuance, something yeah. new and something exciting. And there's not one day that I'm doing cataract surgery where I don't say, wow, I've never seen that before, <laughs> or this is something really brand new. Um, and my only regret sometimes is I say, boy, I wish I had videoed that case. Yeah. I, yeah. you know, so, so I really make a point of doing that. I don't know how you video every case like you do. It's just such a labor of love to do that. But um, sometimes I'll turn to my fellow and I'll say, did we get that on camera? <laughs> uh, and hopefully they did. Now, the last thing I want to ask you is, you're, again, as I said at the beginning of the podcast, you're fantastic on the podium because you're so educational, such great pearls, and you make me just laugh. And it's so memorable. What's the best advice for young people to, for the path to the podium? Because there are a lot of ophthalmologists, young people, uh, men and women in their 30s, maybe in 40s, who really need to start getting more on the podium. I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm becoming an elder statesman on the podium. We need some young blood with no gray hair. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, you earn that privilege of being on the podium. And what you need to do is you need to become very good at something. You need to have something to say. You need to say it in a way that educates people. But at the same time, don't be pedantic. Um, be conversational. I like, when I'm standing at the podium, I feel like I'm talking to a friend. And, 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 that, and that's, what, that's, what makes it fit. that's what makes it fun. And, and, and develop relationships in ophthalmology. I, I think that I have some amazing relationships in my profession. And that has really helped me as well in that we kind of do things together very often. And then finally, if I had to say one other thing about getting onto the podium, it's about really being true to yourself um, sometimes when you're on the podium, you, you'll feel pressured to say what industry wants you to say. And I really believe it's really important, no matter how many companies you work with, is really tell the truth, be forthcoming, be honest about procedures, 
don't embrace technologies that you don't really feel strongly about and be honest because at the end of the day, your reputation is based on your honesty and the perception that people have about you. When you stand on the podium, you talk about something, people know it's the real deal. Um, never sell your reputation short. Always be honest. Uh, and if someone doesn't want to invite you back because you're not representing their product the way you want to, don't worry about that. There'll be other opportunities in the future. But um, being on the podium is one of the most exciting things. And, and in the beginning, I wasn't very good at it. I really, I really think I was a pretty mediocre speaker and it's all about practice. And in the beginning, when you, when I would give talks, I would actually stand in the mirror and, and give my talk standing up, looking in the mirror, making certain that I felt comfortable. And after a while, it became almost second nature. There are very few gifted speakers who can talk extemporaneously right from the beginning. Um, and like everything else, being on the podium is all about practice. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, it, I, I look back and uh, at the beginning, I, my talks were not that good, but you get better and better as you go on and, and you get more practiced about it. Yeah, and the, the, what you said too is about your reputation. It'll take you 10 years to build a reputation. It'll take you 10 minutes to lose it. 10 minutes to lose it. Yeah, it's, it's, if you don't say, you know, if, if you're not true to yourself, you know, yeah. it, your reputation is gone and um, and, and that, at the end of the day, that's the most important thing that you have. And, you know, I've, I embrace social media. I don't use social media that often. I think social media is an extraordinarily important tool, but when you go on social media, have something to say that's relevant. Just don't sure. talk about yourself or the honors that you've received. You know, you, you need to use social media to educate people. Uh, I think that's a new pathway to the podium that we didn't have when you and I were starting off. And and I think that that's an opportunity that a lot of people have going forward. So make certain that your posts are relevant, they're educational, they're interesting. And I don't think it should be 100% self-promotional. Um, try, to, try to think in terms of what will someone take away from my post that will yeah. be relevant to their careers or to their profession rather than trying to show something that really highlights how wonderful you are as a person. I want to read posts from people that really make me think about what I'm doing and challenge me to be a better ophthalmologist. Yeah, it's about, you said about being honest about this. And so for me, like I'm, I'm going to see you got a podium. If I'm going to show a bunch of cases, surgical cases, case one, is going to be me doing something that's not that bright. It'll be a little bit of self-deprecating humor, but more importantly, I'll show you, here's the lesson I learned and here's how I recovered. Right, I think that's what you do better than anybody who day, is that- Have complications? <laughs> you show your mistakes. <laughs> you have to. And you know, at the end of the day, where do we learn? We learn from our mistakes. And if yeah. you can share a mistake with me and, and let me learn from your mistake, you're giving me the greatest service you can do. And you do that. And that's a level of honesty that you very rarely see from other people. And I salute you for doing that because oh. it's really it's really important what you do. So keep it up. I want to see the next 2,000 videos from you. And, and um, <laughs> I'm very proud to be your friend because you do an amazing job with your your platform and we're all better ophthalmologists because oh, of you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a labor of love for sure. But yeah, I always reminded of a saying, the mistake, difference between a mistake and a lesson is you learn from the lesson. Like I gave a talk at the ASCRS, I, I, my cataract coach, best of course. Okay, we had like 600 people in the room, standing room only. And I showed a case of a capsule break. And then I pulled the audience and said, if you do cataract, you raise your hand if you broke the capsule. And then I told everyone else, now look around. Whoever's hand is down is either a neuro-ophthalmologist or not quite fully truthful. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, it's humbling, but I guess, yeah, as you say, that's the best way to learn. You know, we all become better together. That's the beauty of what we do together. We're on the podium. We educate each other. I learn more than I contribute in ophthalmology, I promise you. And uh, we all become better together. Great take-home message, Uday. Uh, it's uh, been great talking to you tonight. And uh, I'm looking forward to reading and seeing every one of your posts going forward. You're, 
you're you're on my list of things that I want to do every day is to look at your videos and learn from them. So until uh, until Maureen bops you for watching more cataract videos. There you go. All right, Eric, thank you so much. I sincerely appreciate it. My pleasure. Take care. Thanks for enjoying that podcast with me. I know I enjoyed it and learned a lot, and I bet you did too. Thank you, Eric, for participating in our little project here. We're going to have a new podcast every week coming up. I want to hear some feedback from you guys, our listeners, our viewers. We have this podcast on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Google, anywhere you find your podcast. We also have it, of course, on cataractcoach.com, and you can watch the full video of it if you want to see our faces on YouTube. But please go to cataractcoach.com, click on the link that's there to contact me, send me a message, let me know what you like about the podcast, what can we do better, and also which future guests would you like to have on our show. Thanks for watching.